morning from Garth Hill School in Bracknell, where we've come for a special edition of Micro Live, in which we look at computers in the classroom. Now, we're in the company of several interested parties tonight, the teachers, the pupils and parents, and they're the ones who make up our very lively audience. Join me in the school bus, where we'll be trying a rather risky experiment which could just teach Fleet Street a thing or two. And I'll be asking Education Minister Chris Patton why the government may be jeopardising Britain's lead in educational software. And I hope to be dropping in later in the programme. Tonight, before we get into the classroom, we're going to try uh, something of an experiment. It's a demonstration, really, of what happens if you mix radio, computers and telephones. Now, obviously, sending data over a phone line is pretty commonplace in homes or offices. But what do you do if you're on the move and there isn't a convenient phone to tap into? Well, just launched is this device. It's a modem which hooks up to one of the new portable cellular radio phones, like this one here from Raykel Vodafone. Now, I've used this and phoned up a printer's in Woking, about 19 miles away, that's Unwin Brothers, and I've got some data for them. In fact, it's text which is stored here on this portable computer. Now, that text is part of the notes for this week's show. In a moment, I'm going to transmit this to Unwin's. They will receive it, they will automatically typeset it, they will print it out, and we hope, we hope, that they will get it right back here by the end of the programme. Can it be done? Well, just to prove that we're not cheating, Leslie... Uh, could you get a word or a phrase from the audience, please? Uh, I'll try, Fred. Uh, excuse me, sir, what's your hobby? Uh, beekeeping. Beekeeping, Fred. <laughs> beekeeping. All right, beekeeping. Uh, yes. B double E hyphen. It's got a buzzword, isn't it? The password. Keeping. K double E P I N G. And there it goes. The new cellular radio phone system works by covering a town with a whole series of transmitter receivers in a honeycomb grid, sometimes only a few kilometres apart. Each transmitter has about 16 radio channels. Whether the vehicle is stationary or on the move, the microcomputer inside the phone is switching all the time from one transmitter to another, trying to find the best signal. When the signal switches or fades, the message is affected for a fraction of a second. With voice, you hardly notice, but with computer data, vital bits of information could be lost. Well, both portable phone systems, BT's Cellnet and the Vodafone service, use similar equipment. And uh, here's the latest, very natty, a pocket unit. Now, both systems can support sending data, but BT's policy is to leave it up to you to make sure that your software and modem check for transmission errors. Vodafone, on the other hand, has introduced its own self-contained error correction system. It's the one we're using tonight. And this means that you've got to have a special modem, here it is, and built-in software. Now, assuming that this all works, you can see how someone like a journalist, for example, could get a story into print very quickly. But it's techniques like this which some of the unions have so far blocked in Fleet Street. Well, there's no blockage here. That data, that text has been sent off to Unwinds, but, of course, whether an error-free version has arrived with them is another matter. Anyway, I shall be uh, phoning them up later on, and I'll let you know how they're coping. Right. Well, we've come to Garth Hill School because it's become a bit of a technology showcase. Now, on the face of it, the school is an ordinary local authority comprehensive with 1,200 pupils, but, in fact, it is far from typical. Through the efforts of the, the headmaster, the staff, the pupils and the parents, many of whom are here tonight, it's managed to provide itself with a remarkable range of computer equipment, literally direct from the manufacturers. Well, earlier this week, we took a look at the veritable Aladdin's Cave available to the pupils here at Garth Hill. This is the computer resource room at Garth Hill School. There are 16 BBC micros here, which means that even the largest class isn't crowded out. At the moment, they're running 16 different programmes, as you can see, but there's more to this system than meets the eye. See, each of these micros can talk to each of the others. In other words, they're networked. It's all very well having a room full of expensive micros, but you don't also want a load of expensive printers and disk drives that will spend most of their time idle. Ideally, you get by with just one of each. By connecting all the micros together into a network, they can each communicate and each have access to those expensive peripherals. And there's another advantage too. The teacher can check the progress of the children by calling up the screen that they're working on. She can do that from any machine on the network, and it doesn't even have to be in this room. Chris Price is the teacher who supervises the use of computers throughout the entire curriculum. 
Chris, can you tell us about some of these programmes that are running at the moment? Yes, we've got programmes which are teaching the children about chemistry by quizzing them about the periodic table. We've got maths programmes which are teaching children about coordinates by making them hunt for a rhino which is lost in the streets of Los Angeles. A rhino? That's right, a rhino. <laughs> we have other programmes which are teaching the children how to spell by taking them through the, the drill and practice of spelling but making it into a game. We've got French programmes which teaches the vocabulary of French and does it in an entertaining way so that they're building the Eiffel Tower while they're actually using these programmes. We've got a programme which is teaching the children how the basics of programming before they get into the realms of BASIC and Pascal by making it into a fun sort of programming yes. language. And what's this one here? This is a grid references programme, so it's a geography programme. Now, you've obviously got some, all kinds of subjects stored here. Now, how do the kids get at the programme they want? Is it difficult? No, it's, it's dead easy. We've made it as easy as we can for them. Perhaps if we ask Madeline and Charlotte to actually take us through the sequence. All right, what do you do? Control break. Control break. Shift and break. And you get the Garfield title page. And you choose a subject. Humanity. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now you now we can choose the subject, with references. So that's a menu there, yes? Take a few minutes. Right, and that's your programme in? Yes. Well, Chris, it all looks very impressive. Is it all plain sailing for you? No, I wish it was. In fact, most software houses who are writing educational software are producing it for single disk drive machines, which means that we have terrible problems actually putting it onto the Ethernet system. We can spend hours upon hours upon hours just transferring it so that we're working on that work. Right. Thank you, Chris. Well, we'll be talking to some software writers later in the show, and maybe they'll have something to say about the lack of support for Econet. In this room, young people are working for a new course in business and information studies. Two O-levels for the price of one. They use these BBC micros networked to a central disk system to learn the basic principles of word processing, telecommunications, data processing, and so on. But that really isn't enough. They need to be familiar with the sort of professional equipment and software and even the environment that they could meet in a real business office or factory. And they can do this on a deck professional for graphics and spreadsheets and so on and get typewriting experience on these Canon electronic typewriters. Leslie Hall, this is a dedicated ICL work processor. What purpose is there in a, somebody learning that when they might meet a completely different machine when they go out to work? Well, as part of the Business and Information Studies course, the students had to complete a two-week work experience. And they worked in local firms, um, Ferranti, 3M, Raycall. And certainly the skills that they acquired in this room provided them with that much more confidence when they came to work with perhaps unfamiliar equipment. So you think it's better having a staging with some real professional equipment rather than moving straight from a BBC micro into a professional environment? Yes, it makes them feel more at home, more comfortable. I see. And have any of them got jobs when they've left school yet? Well, this course has been running for a year and a half, so they will leave in the summer. Um, but I'm quite confident that they will have the edge over other school leavers. Well, this is the third fully equipped computer room here in the school, bringing the approximate capital value of the equipment to around £200,000. Three years ago, this school had one computer and a load of wire. Then it got a new headmaster, Stanley Goodchild. Mm -hmm. Mr Goodchild, how on earth have you done it? Where have you got all this equipment from? Well, the first thing to remember is we run the school very much as a business. We believe in terms like cost-effectiveness, accountability. We're in the business of educating young people for the 21st century, and that's always in, in the fore. Um, we first of all had to help ourselves and we raised a considerable sum of money, in fact £12,000 by the efforts of parents, children, staff and the local community. And we set up our first computer centre, which was quite novel in those days. Um, when we had actually had the computer centre established, we then found industry became very interested. In fact, we helped industry by allowing them to use it as, an, as a, a centre for their own training. And we then felt we had something which we could attract industry to help us. And from that moment till now, we haven't had to put a penny towards the equipment that you see in these three rooms. So are you saying that industry actually donates the equipment to you? Yes, we, in, in return for helping us, we help them because they can put it on their company's curriculum vitae. And also, we get a lot of visitors to the school from all over the world. And so it really is a very good advertisement.
What about maintenance? That must be a problem. Well, it was a problem at first, but not now, because we, we make it very clear to those who help us, it's for them to maintain it. Mm -hmm. Because if it doesn't, it reflects on the company rather than us. Ideally, would you like to see all schools in this country equipped in this way? I think it's absolutely vital that this does happen, because quite honestly, we are preparing youngsters for the, the real world, and information technology is a thing which is here to stay. No gimmicks, it's here to stay. And unless we prepare these children um, for this new world, as it were, um, we're not doing them justice. But is it appropriate that schools, headmasters like yourself, should have to go and beg to industry to no, get the I would say we don't beg, but I know what you mean. Um, but certainly, I think it's not the government and um, the Department of Education and Science must be prepared to put more money into this area because if I was to spend all my capitation for six or seven years, it would take that long to get the equipment that you've seen here today. Is it we couldn't possibly do that. Is it realistic to think that the government is ever going to spend £200,000 per school on equipment? No, but I also believe that schools must help themselves, and I don't think one should sit back and say, because the money's not provided, I'm not going to do anything. Any evidence yet that this emphasis on technology is paying off? It's very early days, but one tremendous thing that's happened is normally we are preparing youngsters and hope they can go on for jobs or further or higher education. This year, when there's normally 40 or 50 or even more youngsters who haven't got jobs by September, there are only two from this school who had not yet found employment. I like to think this is something to do with it as well. Well, clearly Stanley Goodchild has secured an impressive collection of equipment through his deals with industry. But this school is very much the exception. No other school has facilities like it. So what does the average school in Britain offer? There are 24,000 state schools in Britain, 4,000 secondary and 20,000 primary. The children in white represent the primary schools, those in black the secondary. Through government schemes, local authority grants and PTA funding, virtually every school has at least one computer. No other country can make that boast. In fact, the average secondary school has 12.1 computers. It all looks very impressive. But stop. The average secondary school has 900 pupils, and they share those 12.1 computers. That's one computer for every 75 pupils. Seen like this, it looks rather less impressive. But here's an idea which is designed to reduce the scramble for computers. One way of making more computers available is to bus them from school to school. This is a converted London transport bus. As you can see, all the seats have been ripped out and computers installed. In all, we've got 15 BBC micros here. And these facilities are shared between seven local schools. The idea is that the bus will normally turn up at a school for a few days before it moves on to the next one, but that does mean that each school only sees the bus perhaps once a month. Well, the bus driver is also the director of the computer bus service, Ken Payne. Ken, it looks like quite an expensive scheme, so who actually pays? Well, the bus itself and all the equipment for holding the computers, the seats and so on, were paid for by local industry. In fact, the Bracknell and Workingham Schools Industry Partnership. And the computer equipment was bought by the schools concerned. Does that in fact make economic sense or would it be better to have say two micros in each of those seven schools? Well the economics are in favour of running it like this because the computers are always in use. The organisation makes sure that you've always got somebody on the bus all the time. So we get a lot more pupil to computer contact this way. Of course you can cope with a full class in here. Are there any advantages to that? Yes, there are. You can sometimes teach certain things very much better if you've got everybody doing the same thing at the same time. And there are some things, too, that you want to teach them about, like, for example, networking of computers, which you can't really do unless you've got a set of computers collected together like this. Where are we going now? We're going to St Crispin's School in Wokingham. We're going to meet a French teacher, Margaret Jackson, with her class. They'll be on for the first time, in fact. I'm intending to use the bus as an extension to the classroom teaching, which I've already done, as a means of practicing and testing the vocabulary the children have learnt, and as a means of the children having instant access to the answers, which they might not have in the classroom. The computer bus is crucial to St Crispin's School. 
It's a modern comprehensive, typical of many, but it has just three computers, and they're not working. The bus was originally used to give each child hands-on experience of a micro, but with three quarters of the children owning a home computer, the emphasis is now on more traditional subjects. Once on site and linked up to power, lessons can begin. When the program that you have just loaded comes up with the question, choose your words, <coughs> would you choose words number 12 that says to use your word list? All right? You press return. That's it. It says, no, you should have written desk. So now you know little bit of a means desk and you'll be able to do it. It'll now give you another go and you'll be able to get it right this time. This program tests vocabulary. A French word appears on the screen and the children type in the English translation. Each correct answer builds the Eiffel Tower one section higher. Well, the setup certainly seems to work, at least the children here enjoy it. Although it doesn't actually provide any more kit per kid. Of course, hardware is only part of the story, so after the news, we'll have a look at some educational software. Illicit users of WordStar are to be offered an amnesty. Sinclair reveal plans to enter the business computer market. And the computer industry jumps on the Band-Aid wagon. Illicit users of the best-selling word processing package WordStar are to be offered an amnesty against prosecution by software house MicroPro. This follows an amendment to the Copyright Act which came into force last month and made the copying of computer programs illegal. Anyone using a pirated version of WordStar can now register with MicroPro for a fee of £40 plus VAT and in return will become an authorised user. WordStar is probably the most pirated software in the world and the amnesty is likely to end early next year. After that, MicroPro will be considering prosecuting anyone who is using the package illegally. Sir Clive Sinclair has revealed that Sinclair Research is planning to launch a machine for the professional PC market. He was quoted in the Financial Times as saying that he planned to attack the soft underbelly of IBM. Sinclair seems to have abandoned any hopes of selling the QL as a business machine, but is to draw on the strengths of its operating system and software for his new product. The last few months have been very bad for computer journalism in America. Wendy Woods now reports. 1985 will go down as the worst of times for computer magazines. Nearly 60 have gone out of business, even some big names. December will be the last issue of popular computing and creative computing, two of America's most widely circulated computer magazines. The main problem is ad revenue. Computer companies with troubles of their own have drastically cut back on advertising, leaving scores of journalists out of work. Reporting from Silicon Valley for Micro Live, I'm Wendy Wood. After Band-Aid, Live Aid and this week's Fashion Aid comes the computer industry's contribution to famine relief. Called Online Aid, the idea is that companies contribute sums of money ranging from £1,000 to £5,000 in return for their names featuring in the Online Aid adverts. A quarter of a million pounds worth of advertising space has already been donated. And finally, tomorrow is the start of National Astronomy Week and Lancashire Polytechnic is giving away a free computer-based guide to Halley's Comet. It runs on BBC Micros and includes star maps and details of how to spot the comet in the night sky. Any school or organisation can have a copy of the programme by sending a floppy disk or tape and a stamped addressed envelope to Lancashire Polytechnic. At the beginning of the show, we sent our programme notes to a local printer using cellular radio phone. Earlier this week, Fred went down to Unwinds to take a look at the technology involved. In a building that once used to be an old paper mill, Unwinds has some of the most sophisticated computer typesetting equipment in the country. Uh, this, for example, is a multi-disc reader. It can handle almost any text so long as it's on disc, here, for example, there's a five and a quarter inch slot, and here's the three and a half. And it doesn't even matter which computer you've been using to write your major epic. This machine will read that disk onto the main Miles computer over there. But of course, obviously, it's handy if you've also included control codes to format the text into chapters and paragraphs, italics and bold type, and so on. 
Now, Micro Live's experiment takes all this a few stages further. Obviously, you can read a disc at a distance, providing you're hooked in via a phone line and a modem. But tonight, of course, we're not using a phone line as such. We're using cellular radio. When all that data comes in across the airwaves, it's captured onto disc via this Raycal Vodata modem here at a speed of 1,200 bits per second. From the disc to the camera-ready artwork is a matter of a couple of minutes, or in our case, I'm told, 57 seconds. And at this point, we rejoin the age of steam. This cartridge of film here must be developed and then photo etched onto a plate ready to roll around a printing press. And that procedure could take anything up to, well, 10 minutes if they're quick. Well, we've just been in touch with Unwin's The Printers. We had a bit of a scare because a fumble-fingered Fred pressed the wrong button and we had to send the data twice. But apparently, sorry about that, the presses are still rolling. And the first batch of notes is already finished. Unwin's are very pleased with themselves. It took only 11 minutes, 10 seconds from the time they got the text to the instant it left the press. How are we getting it here? Well, at this very moment, there's a dispatch rider speeding his way to us. He, he left about a minute ago. And we've also got a backup scheme just in case he can't make it. Getting computer hardware into schools is all very well, but of course it's the software which matters in the end. It was the Labour government which first saw the need to spend money to create good educational software when Mrs Shirley Williams was the Education Secretary. When the Tories came to power, they put £9 million into setting up MEP, the Microelectronics Education Programme. Well, with this pump priming money, it's commissioned software and trained teachers in the use of micros. By the way, Scotland has a separate, similar scheme. It's been an uphill struggle. Good software takes a long time to write, it's difficult to specify, and it's got to be very robust if it's not to crash. A typical package may cost £30,000 or more to develop. Since then, from its headquarters in Newcastle, and now with an annual budget of £5 million, MEP has sponsored an impressive array of software, which is marketed through publishers. This summer, at the World Conference for Computer Education held in the United States, British software was considered by many of the delegates to be the best in the world. Here's an example of the sort of real-life problem which has inspired software writers to take British software, and by the way, Himalayan climbers like my friend Chris Bonington, to the very top. I spent months actually planning the expedition. We had to get the right amount of rope, we had to get the right amount of food, we had to make sure that all our Sherpas were firstly the right number of them and then we had to have them in the right place at the right time. And to do all this, I actually used a computer and played out a computer game of actually climbing the mountain with all the hazards that we might encounter. And this meant that when I was actually on the climb, when we were faced with some kind of crisis, it meant that I could actually react to it because I'd actually played it out back at home on the computer. Chaz, uh, Wendy and Julian here are working with a programme that's based on Bonington's Ascent of Everest. It's called Summit, and by taking into account the sort of information about the geography and the weather conditions on the mountain, what they're doing is working out how best to plan the climb and then use the manpower available to move essential stores up the mountain and generally keep the expedition supplied. In fact, you're making sort of life and death decisions, aren't you, standing here? Yes. Well, you've been fertling about with this during the day. Have you managed to form an opinion of it? Do you think it's good we, educational software? Yeah, yeah we, we think, think it's, it's exciting. Good, I mean, we have to decide for the team if they're going to live or die basically because we have to get stores up to them. So that really does make quite a difference, yes. the fact that it could possibly be a real life situation. Yeah, exactly. Decision making programme. Yeah. Yes. Well, what are you actually learning? I mean apart from the excitement, what, what part of the academic syllabus are you, are you covering here? Well you need very careful planning to plan the stores to take up to the men on the mountain mm -hmm. and this also includes a little maths but we didn't really feel there was a lot of geography in the game. Right. Tell me, how would you have felt about dealing with these problems that you're, you're grappling with if they'd all just been laid out in a textbook? I don't think it would have been so interesting. I mean, I'll put the book down. you put the book down. Mm -hmm. Right, well, carry on up the mountain. Don't get frostbite. Uh, with us uh, this evening as well is Richard Fothergill, director of MEP. Uh, Richard, did you hear that just then? There's not mm -hmm. enough geography in the geography package. <laughs> Yes, well, a good piece of software should cover a wide range of activities. They were doing problem solving, making good decisions. They were doing mathematics. There's a lot of writing going to develop from that sort of work. 
So it covers a wide range of aspects of the curriculum and not just geography. And that's what all good computer software is doing these days. So you're looking for it to have sort of related work. Mm -hmm. but, but what about, I mean, they look at, they use the software for what, half an hour an hour. Do they then just put it away in a drawer and that's it? Well, good software, again, should be just part of a whole learning activity. So in this particular case, mm. one would expect work on how the Sherpas live in Nepal, living conditions. You could have work on what the human body does as it adjusts to changes in temperature and going up mountains and oxygen failure. You could have land formed as crevasses are formed and so on. A lot of meteorology is the different snow conditions. So there's a great deal of other work that's going on as well. And this is just one of the resources and one of the stimuli. So half an hour of software should provide weeks and weeks, really, of, of, of very wide teaching. Indeed. OK, what else have you got to show us? Well, one programme which I thought you might be interested in is the mole concept. Um, this programme was developed with the BBC Radio, Schools Radio, and it consists of notes, teacher's notes, a disc with the software on it, and an audio cassette. Now, the interesting thing is you put the audio cassette into the cassette recorder, the disc into the disc drive, and the two, pro two parts run together simultaneously. They're synchronised together. So that here is a very difficult chemical concept. A lot of children find it very hard to understand. You get a voice supporting the software as it goes along. And if we listen to this for a moment, you may recognise the voice. Right. Mention the word mole to most people, and this is what they think of. A short-sighted garden pest. But to a scientist, the word mole means something altogether different. In chemistry, a mole is a number, an amount an astronomically huge amount. To understand why we need such a huge amount, we must first think about things which are infinitesimally small. Atoms. Atoms are often depicted rather like this. A heavy core with lighter particles which orbit around it. Remember that this is not intended to be a true picture of an atom. Now, those, the pictures and the words are absolutely smashing, but wouldn't they do just as well on video? No, because this is an interactive programme. That chime you heard just now mm. call, asked the children to press the space bar on the computer to move the programme on. And they will be, in the moment, as you see, answering questions, which check how far they have got as they go along through the programme. And then later, we will find that at the end of the programme, there'll be a simulation of an important experiment for them to develop. And this will be a very interactive activity for them. So they're actually moving the progr programme along with the speed of their own progress? Yes, indeed they are, Excellent. and that's the key of it. Right, well, let's see what else Fred's got to say. But remember, a mole is an amount. It's a number of things. You can't have a mole on its own any more than you can have a dozen or a million. You must say what the objects are. A dozen eggs. A million pounds. A mole of... Ping pong balls. If you had a mole of ping pong balls, you'd have trouble storing them. They'd cover the entire Earth to a depth which would swamp Mount Everest. Now, as we've just seen, and as I said, that particular program ends with a titration experiment, a simulation of that. It is very important that children do the practical work as well. And this is another experiment, a programme which based itself on a well-known physics experiment for 17 to 18-year-olds. Now, this one is for physics, and it creates a sort of micro-laboratory in which you can look at the way an object uh, goes up and down against gravity and with different forms of velocity and what happens to its weight and displacement. So three very important physical principles are established and looked at. Displacement theory, acceleration and velocity. And a child can explore all sorts of parameters, about 26 different variations in the way they look at this and the different displays. Right. Why is British software considered to be relatively so good? I think for three reasons, really. One, we make very good use of graphics. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we are very teacher-orientated in the development. Teachers are always involved all the time. And thirdly, we look at the concepts of learning. So we're look, asking children to develop skills like problem solving, like design, like making things. Uh, like creativity, exploring their mind and discovering information. That's the exciting bit. Thanks, Richard. Thanks Thank very you. much indeed. Thank you.
Well, obviously, good software is of enormous value to pupils, to teachers, and, of course, there's an endless amount of educational material to be developed into software. But what sort of financial value does it have for the people who actually publish it? Well, in the audience tonight is Roger Watson from Longman's, the publishers. Mr. Watson, Mr. Watson can your company see any sort of profit out of uh, producing educational software? Well, not at the moment. Not, not if you have to pay the development costs. Mm. If you think that an average piece of educational software may sell between, say, 500 and 1,000 copies at a price of 15 or 20 pounds, you can imagine that is difficult to cover the production, the promotion, the distribution, and so on. You certainly can't recover 20, 30,000 pounds of, of development costs. Big, big shortfall between the development costs and, and the, cost, the, the money that you get back in selling Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Now, how vital do you think the MEP funding has been in developing educational software? Well, it's been critical because uh, a really very large proportion of the excellent software which we now have available in this country has been funded, the development has been funded by MEP. Oh, thanks very much indeed. Mac? Well, just as we seem to have a world lead, many people are worried that this might be lost. The government is axing MEP in four months' time, replacing it with something called the Microelectronic Support Unit. With less than half MEP's budget, it won't have a role in commissioning new software and it won't be helping to train teachers as MEP does. MEP has only 17 weeks to run, yet the new support unit so far has no staff and no premises. Its role will be simply to advise on the use of software in the classroom and not to produce it. However, the Department of Trade and Industry is providing half a million pounds this year to local authorities to purchase existing software packages, with two million pounds next year. But that still means a cut in real terms in the money allocated to information technology in schools and no central subsidy to create new software. I asked former Education Secretary Mrs Shirley Williams, is this cut in spending on computers in education really justified? No. This is an area where Britain has a world lead. Mr Butcher, the Parliamentary Secretary at the Department of Trade and Industry, said as much in December 1984 to the House of Commons, so the government believes it itself. Why then should we throw away the lead by changing the organisational structure of the MEP system, the microelectronic support system, and handing it over to local authorities as far as curriculum development, software development and in-service education are concerned, when, frankly, the local authorities are so strapped for cash they can't even maintain their current hardware and they can't maintain the in-service programmes for teachers. It is absolutely nonsensical. But it's very easy to say that, but nevertheless it's a matter of priorities. If you're not going to give it to computers and education, if you're going to give them more, you've got to take it away from somebody else. Who would you take it away from? Let's be honest, it's all a question of priorities. If you think the most important thing in the world is tax cuts, then you tell the Department of Education and Science to cut their budgets in order to finance a tax cut. Our view is very directly that that is absolutely to get the priorities wrong and that this is an area where Britain could build a major export market where she is in advance of the rest of the world and where we would be in great danger if we lose that lead. Already the MEP have sold about a million pounds of the software overseas and they won't even given any money for expenses. Do you think that could be significantly increased? Yes, not only should it be, I think we should set up something rather like the Ministry of Trade and Industry project teams in Japan and get the manufacturers, the Department of Education and Science, the Department of Trade and Industry together to write up a strategy for the future to take Britain into the export markets of the world where we have, I repeat, a major lead we shouldn't lose. So you forecast that this present support unit really is going to not do any good at all, really? No, it will do some good. The trouble is it's an inadequate good. It's not enough to keep the programme going. And at a time when the government is also cutting down on its support for the so-called information technology centres, which train youngsters in further education, one has to ask, why is the government giving up? on one of this country's few remarkable achievements in the whole international world of education. I put it to Education Minister Chris Patton earlier this week that if the future prosperity of Britain is going to depend more and more on the information industries, isn't this a bad time to kill the MEP when even his own department has said it's doing a good job? It has been a terrific success and it has put us ahead of the rest of the world. Uh, I don't see it as killing the um, MEP. Uh, when we first set it up in 1980, we reckoned it should have a life of about four years while it got other things going. Uh, in 1983 we thought it should be continued for an extra couple of years to 1986 and we've been discussing with the local education authorities and others since then what should, uh, what should follow it in order to consolidate the work we're doing and I think the support unit 
uh, is the right sort of uh, body, the right sort of uh, instrument to carry on the work which the MEP has done so successfully. But that is only half the amount of money the MEP had. Is it, is it true that your department really wanted to double the amount of money rather than halve it for the MEP? No, I, I, I think there are always discussions with uh, the Treasury and others about how much money one should spend on, on this or that. Uh, but uh, we've also got to take into account not only the money that's being spent through the support unit, the two million plus that we announced last, last summer, uh, but also the money that's being spent through John Butcher's uh, DTI program to encourage software in schools following the very successful micro in schools program. Also the uh, work which is being done through the technical and vocational education initiative. Uh, I've seen a great deal of very successful work done through that, which has involved, of course, the purchase of equipment and software. The most successful thing the MEP did, I think, was creating new educational software. Yes. And with the support unit, they're not doing that. They're expecting the local authorities to actually buy more software. Nobody's going to create it. That's going to create a real shortage of new software, isn't it? Now, I, I hope that we'll be able to uh, still help in the development of materials for curriculum development because it's very important particularly cross-curricular developments which is where I think we've got to make a rather more progress but the other schemes which I've suggested should help to create a market as well I agree with you that the more experience we've had uh, the better the software on the whole that we've produced but it does re need direct funding from government you can't just expect it to the, the publishers to take these very high risks in producing education it's software. going to still get some help um, in development and we're still helping to create a market we'll also be still doing all we can uh, to ensure that internationally in terms of exports uh, we can uh, develop a market and see that British industry this particular industry uh, gets access to it is it true that IT has become rather a peripheral activity from what it was in Kenneth Baker's day when it was very prime? Is it becoming a little bit peripheral with politicians and civil servants today? No, it isn't. I don't think that's fair. I think it's perfectly reasonable to um, commend Kenneth Baker on the marvellous job he did. But when I go around schools seeing things from my angle, uh, I don't think you could possibly say it was peripheral. What we've got to do is to build on the successes, build on the foundations which were laid very well by people like Kenneth Baker and others as well. Well, first of all, I'd like to go to a software writer, Margaret Cox from Chelsea College. If all the cash is going to be spent on existing software, what's going to be the demand for new software that you write? Well, one of the problems there is in writing new software is with the extending technology and hardware that is available, it now costs a lot of money to write particular programs. You need a range of expertise, just like you do with a television crew. You need people with hardware, software, educational, research and other expertise. And so you need quite an investment in a team before you can even take off. With the changing technology as well, and the teachers requiring better, more versatile, more interesting software, you therefore need an enormous investment before you're going to produce anything of worth for the schools. Where did you get your money from before? Before the MEP? Yes. Um, we got money from the schools council which preceded the MEP and of course the computers were smaller then so the software was smaller. Some of the so sorts of software you've been showing in this school. For so example. it was cheaper to write? Yes, yes that's I right. see. Well perhaps I should ask Mike uh, Fisher who is a manufacturers managing director of uh, RML. Will you be investing in developing more new software? We have invested in developing some software with educational software vendors in the past and now with the MEP funding going we'll do more to help and the government scheme will also encourage us to do more. But the sort of sums that will contribute to organisations such as Chelsea will be very small compared to that which has been available through MEP funding over the last few years. Tom Hardy from Cambridge University Press, perhaps uh, has the market, have you seen the market diminishing and do you see it diminishing in the future? The market was never a very large one in UK schools in any case. Uh, software products do not sell to schools in large numbers. I uh, hope that in the years to come with the DTI scheme we may see um, a temporary expansion of the software market in, in, the, in the next year and, and the year following. But what happens after that is, is an open question. Is networking and piracy an issue? Um, networking is, is certainly an issue. Um, more and more schools, as was mentioned earlier in the program, are networking their machines together. And some publishers are paying attention to the need to provide networking software, certainly. Piracy is another very serious problem. I, 
we don't have evidence of the levels of piracy of educational software in schools. I'm sure that some goes on, but equally you can understand teachers having the need to make the software available to their pupils. Richard Fothergill, if you'd have had this extra money, what would you have done with it? Well, there are two major needs. First of all, there is a major need for in-service training for teachers. Uh, the amount of money available to local education authorities at the moment is pitiful for in-service training and we want a real major impact in this if we are to get more and more teachers using the software that's available and right across the curriculum, please. The second thing is the development of new materials, the new software. We've developed, I think, an expertise at the leading edge of the, the development of educational activity in this country. And that we need to survive and support. And it's tragic that that sort of unit and the units that have been doing that will not be able to survive in the future. So those are the two aspects. Stanley Goodchild, perhaps I'd come to you. And, and what do you think about, what would you like to see the, the publishers doing with your software? Well, the one great worry for all schools, primary and secondary, is the expense of buying single pieces of software. And I hope the publishers can soon come to realise that perhaps a better way of marketing the product is to do it by licensing, licensing to local education authorities, which will then enable schools, even the very small primary schools, to have access to the very good software that's available. Margaret, perhaps I come back to you now, because there was a question asked earlier on in the programme about why there's not sufficient software for Econet. What's the reason for that? Well, there are really two reasons. One is that a lot of the software was produced before the Econet chip arrived, and so you have to reorganise the software using the memory in order to make it run on an Econet system. The other problem is that the Econet system itself poses limitations on the memory which don't occur with more powerful machines. And so in the case of a lot of our software, which is very powerful and uses every inch of memory there is, it's very difficult to get it to run on a small machine which takes up some of the memory with the Econet chip. Thank you, Margaret. Well, there it is. There seems to be a case of throwing educational software into a risky open market is going to lose the lead that we've established and waste the investment we've already made in equipping our schools with computers. That the amount of cash involved is peanuts makes the decision even more strange. Mm. Mac, <laughs> oh, and ladies hello. and gentlemen, it's well timed actually. We're going to have to call a halt to the discussion. I gather that the conveyor of our programme notes has been spotted over the hill, so to speak. I didn't know there were any hills in Bracknell, did you? No, none at all. Right. So uh, I think I'll hand over to our one-man reception committee out there on the turf. Uh, Fred? <laughs> one man? I don't know about that. Have a look at this lot. We've got people all over the place. Yes, he's here, our, our motorcyclist, Peter Cranston. Here he comes. He's got the notes in his backpack. Right, let's see if I can have a quick word with him. I'll take one of these out. What sort of trip did you have, Peter? I've been here quicker, I'm going to get stuck behind a bus. <laughs> oh, no. Well, I've timed it out at 37 minutes, 32 seconds. Follow us in, Peter. I've got the notes here. And here they are. Oh, it's slippery out there. What a magnificent oh. achievement. I, oh, no, hang on. We ought to hold well, for no. a minute, Congratulations. Aren't we? <laughs> Congratulations, we think, because what we must do is check that this piece of paper is bona fide. Uh, has it got that random word at the bottom? The password is... Beekeeping. What a wonderful yes, hobby. Indeed, well, I think we've... Congratulations and a round of applause yes, for well done, Pete, Pete the Bike. <laughs> Right, that was 30, 37 minutes, 32 seconds. Now, if you want those notes, they're, variety, they're available from a variety of sources. You can uh, dial up Telecom Gold, just put in Info BBC, there's the bulletin board, or there's old snail mail, that's at the end of the programme, we'll have the address. OK, <laughs> right, well, that's all for us for tonight. Next week, we'll be back at our new time of 7 o'clock from all of us here at Bracknell. Goodbye. 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 I think we'll have a few of these out. Yeah, yeah. You've got some more? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah.